before we begin, let me inform you of a couple of things. Um, as Horace said, uh, Brother Kenneth Hagin's vision of 1963 is in the foyer. Uh, the State of the Church Address is in the foyer. And after the service today, the State of the Church Part 2, which we taught on Monday night, will also be in the foyer. And for the first time ever that the Lord has ever told me to do this, uh, the study notes of today's message will also be in the foyer. Uh, Thank you. when uh, this service is over. So uh, he also said that you are to make copies of it, to put it around in your house, uh, in your business, uh, many different places where you might want to put it. He told us to put it around here in this church, the notes that will be given out today. So anyway, that will be after the service. Uh, so you can take that and do whatever you Amen. choose to do, which I hope is what the Lord said. So uh, I am absolutely positive that um, many people, you could go many places today and not hear a message like this. Uh, but I am also absolutely positive that this is what the Lord said to do and to follow the State of the Church Address and to, make, to get us ready for the return of the Lord. And if you paid attention to the State of the Church Address, both Sunday morning and Monday night services, um, you know that uh, the Lord prepared us for some difficult times, and particularly on last Sunday's message. And if you haven't gone through those notes, and it's not a reason in the world for you not to, everybody there, we're giving them to you uh, directly as they were given to me. And um, so you're gonna find yourself, whether you're gonna make the decisions of what he said, whether to walk in faith or walk in fear in the days that are in front of us. I know that there are many people that are acting like our, the greatest days uh, for America are in front of us. That is not what the Lord said. He said for the world, things were going to get worse and worse, and that's in last Sunday's message. He said a lot of things but for those of us who belong to the Lord Jesus Christ, it is our finest hour. Amen. Meaning by that, it is our opportunity to shine in the middle of the darkness. It's our opportunity to take advantages, as the Lord said in the message, uh, things that will come our way. It's our opportunity to take advantage of those particular times for His glory, Amen. to shine for His glory. And so I... I wanted just to say that to you in case none of you ever come back after today. <laughs> I love you and I appreciate you and the blessings of the Lord upon you, amen. Uh, uh, this, when, when the Lord brought this message and, or gave this message, uh, I thought, oh no. I, I mean, that's, I'm being honest, that's really what I thought. Oh, no, surely not. And uh, I've gotten over that. And I'm saying, thank you, Jesus, now. Amen. And, and uh, thank you for preparing us, for, for warning us. Remember that the Lord said in, in his book that he, will, he does nothing unless he tell his servants, his prophets, or his prophetic church is what he said. He does nothing that he does not forewarn. Now you know as good as I do that everybody, no one, very few people want to know what's going on. Most people want to hide their head in the sand and they just want to ignore and just act as if nothing has happened. I'm talking about the church world. The church world doesn't want to know too much. Uh, they just rather go on and living in their own little la la land, but that's not gonna be that way. 
And it's important for you to, even though this coming week there is a home going service uh, Thursday night, it still is very important for you to be in services uh, during the week and at any time that you can. It's very important uh, in the days that we have left upon this earth. It's, it's so important that we do. Again, I want to thank all of you who have come out this morning. So today, we're talking about the uh, preparation for persecution. This, the title of the message is Preparation for Persecution. I did not name it. Even he, the Lord does not always give the title when he uh, began to speak to me. But he gave the title this time. That's when I said, oh, no, with the, with the title. So preparation for persecution. You will be pleased in the long run how your God is looking after you and what he's doing. For me, at least, the most startling words in the 2022 State of the Church message was two statements that we found in it. Number one was, you have entered the days of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. When I read that part, which was halfway through of the 2022 State of the Church, when I read that, I thought, oh, no, again, because I knew uh, the times and the seasons of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And my first, my first impulse, uh, maybe, maybe you don't go that way, but I do. I'm very real with the Lord. I don't try to put on any kind of front. He knows me anyway. And I said, oh, no. And then the part that said, prepare yourself for the fiery furnaces of this evil world. And uh, I didn't like that part very much either. And I probably said, oh, no, again. But let me, let me take just one little second to take us to Daniel for a minute, because I'm not going to assume that everyone has gone back. And I told you to read Daniel 3, and I told you to read Esther with the decision she had to make. Uh, if I perish, I perish. She had to make bold decisions in the world in which she found herself living. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is found in Daniel 3. I'm not going to read all of it, but if you have your word, and it's not on the screen. Uh, so if you have your, your Bibles, you know to start off with Nebuchadnezzar, the king, the president, the king, whoever you want to call him, the head honcho, uh, at that particular time made a statue of himself. And in that uh, statue, gold statue, uh, it ended up being that he said that everyone when they heard musical instruments play, that everyone would bow down and worship that statue. And of course, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the three buddies of Daniel, uh, they were not doing that, and they were reported by, you know, uh, other people around, just, and, and went to the king and said, they're not paying any attention to what you put out, king. They refuse to serve your gods, and they will not worship your gold statue. So that's the place they found themselves in, having to make a decision. Then it goes on to say, uh, then they call Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, called him into Nebuchadnezzar, or to the officials, we could put it that way, to the officials, even though they went directly to the king because they were working for the king. And uh, the king said to them, is it true, is it true, that you refuse to serve my gods or to worship the gold statue I have set up. And then the king says, I'm going to give you one, I'm going to give you another opportunity. I'm going to give you a chance to change your decision. Uh, I'm going to give you an opportunity for you to think this thing through uh, because you have already heard what happens if you don't do it. So I'm going to give you, an, it's like he's been a friend. I'm going to give you an opportunity to make a decision. And then Shadrach and, Nish and uh, Meshach and Abednego, they replied to him. And they said, uh, when they said, you know, you'll be thrown into a furnace and will burn in that furnace. And their response was, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from the power of your majesty. But even if he does it, that's a big statement. 
But even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you, Your Majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue that you have set up. And you know the story. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar said, make the furnace seven times hotter than four, threw all of them into the furnace, tied them up in their clothes and everything so they'd burn him faster and everything else, heated it seven times higher, and the people who threw them in there ended up burning up because it was so hot. And uh, you remember that uh, at one point Nebuchadnezzar looked in, and when he did, he was calling all his little folks around him and said, come in and look there, then we put three people in there, looks like there's four in there, and one looks like a god. And uh, so they all looked, and sure enough, I think it's so funny every time I read this, it may not be funny to you, it's just funny to me, that he had to ask them to come out. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I just think that's so cool. You know, he literally, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you know, he, he asked them, he says, you know, come out, come here, come on out. And then, you know, and from that, you remember it says that the fire had not touched them, not a hair on their heads were singed, and their clothing was not scorched. They didn't even smell of smoke. And as a result of that, though, you cannot forget as a result of that, that uh, uh, the king and, and those around began to praise the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That's whatever comes our way, the outcome should be. That whomever sees us or knows us or encounters us, that what should happen in the days that are directly in front of us, whatever takes place, however you and I live our lives, we should hope that in the midst of all of it, they will be able to proclaim their God is something else. Their God is something else. And that's why we are still here. That's our testimony, to live a life so that those around will want to follow our God. So in light of that, again, two startling words, you know, you've entered the days of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, repeated three times in the 2022 message, and prepare yourself for the fiery furnaces of this evil world. So when Jesus delivered the Sermon on the Mount, he opened the message with a series of blessed are those and blessed are you. We're talking about the, you know, the, the Sermon on the Mount. And as you read through what you and I call the Sermon on the Mount, that, that of course is taken from Matthew 5 through 7. When you read through it, you find out that the first seven are declared uh, just with one sentence. But when you get to the one we're about to read, Blessed are those. Jesus says more than one sentence about this particular issue. Matthew 5, 10 through 12. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. The key word is because of me, because of Jesus. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now, what we need to understand, we need to pay attention that we have to admit when we read those scriptures, those three verses, we don't think like Jesus thinks. I mean, we just don't come at it like he does. I mean, we, you know, we, we just aren't there. And... Matter of fact, we're so naive and so uh, uh, sometimes so simple-minded in our walk with the Lord and so self-centered that we end up, even when we are being corrected, uh, you know, whether it's uh, rebuked or corrected, we think we're being persecuted. That is not what the Bible calls persecution at all. Even though we say, you know, I, I mean, I've heard it spoken back at me many, many times. You know, I can handle this persecution or I, you know, this. And, and, and it all has to do with being corrected or being rebuked. And again, that is, that is not at all what the Bible calls persecution. Amen. Not at all. We are just so self-centered that anytime anybody corrects us, 
or comes against us or tries to rebuke us or try to put in order something that you and I have made mistakes about and need to be put in order or when we have not lived correctly in front of people or we've done things we should not do or have not lived by the standards that Jesus holds up there and when someone comes and, and addresses it, we at that point are so high-minded that we think, well, just, I'm just being persecuted. Let me get it straight again. That is not persecution. That is not what the Bible calls persecution. So our minds and our hearts, friends, should be on eternity. We should rejoice and be glad. I mean, everything, we should be thinking about eternity. We're on our way home. Amen. And I mean, we're way past halfway down the road. I mean, we, we, we're past, you know, if there's a hundred mile markers and when you get to a hundred, you're there. My friend, we're, we're about to see the marker in front of us. I mean, we're way down the road. We're, we're going home. I mean, that's where we are. These are last days of going home. Now, I am also aware that a lot of people don't even want to hear that because they've got so much they want to do. There's so much they want to do. They want to do themselves or their own plans with their own uh, what they, uh, with their own life, uh, with their children, their grandchildren, or great grandchildren, or whatever, and and their own plans, what they have, what they want to live, how they want to live. I hadn't even half lived. I mean, if you're living by the world standard, you ain't lived yet. Amen. You know, I mean, God's ways are not our ways, and as we get closer to His return, He's He's clarifying some things, and calling you know, uh, us to come back to a certain standard, which has always been here. But we've always written our own standards, and we have done our own crazy interpretations of what God said. Now, it would help me if you'd smile a little bit as we go along, so hallelujah. <laughs> I've been looking around to see, where can I look? I, but anyway, but hallelujah. Anyway, so the very first principle that he says is that you are blessed when you are persecuted. Church, that is not the way we think, you know. And the Lord warned us about persecution. He warned us in the 2022 message. He forewarned us. And, of course, maybe that's why some folks don't want to keep coming very much. I'd rather go where they don't talk about this. You know, give me something that just blesses me. I don't want to hear what's happening. The day will come. You will wish you had heard. I promise you. So the Lord told us persecution was coming. So let's make sure we understand exactly what he means and how it operates so that we can prepare effectively whatever may come our way so that you and I can walk in faith and we can walk in wisdom. He gives a definition of what is persecution. And this is his definition. Religious persecution is the systematic mistreatment of an individual are a group of individuals on the basis of their religious belief. So I'm going to give this, the, not my whole notes, but an outline. And of course that's on it. Religious persecution is the systematic mistreatment of an individual or a group of individuals on the basis of their religious beliefs. And it manifests, persecution manifests itself uh, as discrimination for the purpose of forcing Christians to assimilate, to leave, or to live as second-class citizens. Amen. That's the whole purpose of it. In other words, they do things like, you make me uncomfortable. <laughs> or, you know, or uh, all the different things that we have seen happen. Uh, I don't, I don't want to talk about that. I hate you talk about that. I don't want to have anything to do with that. Or the things that are happening across our nation now are unprecedented. Amen. Things that are happening across our world, whether you're keeping up with it or not, are absolutely uh, the scariest things that you could possibly imagine. Uh, in China, they're locking the doors. If you have COVID, they're locking the doors from the outside. And people are starving to death. In Australia, they have made you not a member of society. And, and uh, uh, in other countries of the world are beginning to follow suit. I could begin to name them to you. It's not one or two. It is a good number. In Israel, it is unbelievable what's happening in that country. 
And I'm just saying to you, to think it is not here, just because it hadn't knocked on your door, or because God has graced us in this precious bubble, does not mean that it's not happening across the United States. I'll assure you it is. I could give you testimony after testimony. So let me go on and help you. So when carried out uh, in a nation or a group's policy, Christians, when Christians are harassed, intimidated, threatened, humiliated, and uh, at times imprisoned for their faith, uh, you know, the question is, why are we persecuted? We're different. And the world doesn't like people who don't conform to it. And another reason, we're children of light, the world's children of darkness. We're alive in the spirit. They're dead in the spirit. We live by faith. They live by sight. Therefore, we understand the world far more than the world understands us. And you think you don't understand them, honey. They sure didn't understand us. I'll assure you of that. And, and, uh, and they never will based on the Scripture because look what the Scripture says in 1 Corinthians 2. But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, one who is not born again. For their foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. Now, you see, for instance, let me take a simple thing. Try explaining to the world. I could say try explaining to the church. Try explaining to the world tithing. There is no way possible, and particularly in these end days, when finances are difficult for a lot of people and uh, different things are happening, try explaining tithing. Uh -huh. They will call you the biggest fool known to mankind. Right. How stupid. The church is trying to take your money. They will absolutely attack you and the church if you make a statement that you are a tither right. in these rough days that we are entering and that we are in. The sad part about it is, is that in all honesty, that even inside the church when things get rough, people want to quit tithing. It's the last thing in the world you should do. That's right. uh, you know, That's right. I mean, it's just the last thing in, in the world. I mean, you know, uh, in hard times you can't afford, you cannot afford not to tithe. That's right. Because tithing is the key to your provision. And you cannot explain it. You can't sit down and say, one, two, three, this, blah. You can't do it. It's by faith. It's by faith. So, number one, what is persecution? Number two, there are five stages of persecution. Number one, it begins with stereotyping Christians. For example, creating nicknames to be used in describing a group of people targeted for persecution. Like, you know... Bible thumpers, or tongue talkers, or snake handlers, or they just fall on the floor all the time, or hypocrites. <laughs> this type of stereotyping has been around for centuries, generalizing, you know, uh, groups of people without any fact, without any reason. And it always comes from a critical and judgmental spirit. That's people who, with their mouth, begin to attack. See, any time that you appear that you love God more than somebody else, some, they're going to attack you like a snake let loose. Any time you begin to talk about that you may have, have had an experience with the Lord, and you're not bragging about it, you're just trying to share. Maybe you want somebody just to hear it. When someone who is not pressing into the Lord or someone who is not eager to know the things of the Lord, they're going to judge you like crazy. They're absolutely going to begin to lash out at you and make fun of you. It's, un it's unbelievable what they will do when they see that, uh, that you may be really touching an area that they... Uh, don't know much about. 
If you don't know anything about it, leave it alone. Amen. You know, let, let the Lord handle it, you know. So stereotypes are a big problem in our society uh, because they dictate, they dictate how others should live or act, and they generate a judgmental spirit, as I just said. And they undermine the potential in others with cliques like all teenagers are rebels. All men drive better than women. We all know that's not true. <laughs> Girls are not good at sports. All blondes are ditzy. All Muslims are terrorists. All country folks are stupid. That is not true. Amen. Now, I just see these generalizations of groups like these, stereotypes, they can have a profound uh, you know, impact on people, particularly on children. Yeah. And yet we talk about them, and when it comes to persecution, stereotyping people, it lays a foundation for prejudice, for discrimination, and for criminalization. That was just number one. Number two, the second stage is slander or vilify. Uh, is to slander or vilify Christians for alleged crimes or unwelcome conduct. At this stage, Christians start being called domestic terrorists or bigots or even criminals. They describe us as narrow-minded, hateful, intolerant, mean and harmful to the freedom and dignity of non-Christians, all because we believe the Bible. Just because we believe the Bible. And when you are a person who believes uh, in, in the sanctity of life, and you come against those who are pushing abortion, or those with different lifestyles opposite of what the Bible says, and you begin to, you begin to stand firm with the Word of God, I promise you, at that point, they are going to do everything to slander you and vilify you. I guarantee you. Number three, when that behavior is allowed to continue, then what happens? The third stage, and it's the influence of the church is marginalized or stigmatized, however you want to call it, by society. The whole church is. Uh, and how does this play out? Christians begin to find themselves banished from social media platforms like Facebook and YouTube. This is number three stage. In some countries, live streaming of religious services has already been stopped. It's being talked about here in America as the preaching of the gospel is considered offensive. In this stage of persecution, Nativity scenes at Christmas time are forbidden, as are public displays of the cross. Bibles and Christian literature is forbidden in schools and before long even in public libraries. That is happening already. In the workforce, Christian men and women are forbidden to have a Bible on their desk and are in the lunchroom or wherever. Even the wearing of a Christian-themed jewelry is targeted. Recently, a nurse in another state who wore a very small gold cross necklace was fired for the crime of wearing it. That's stage three. Stage four. The fourth stage is criminalize the Christian by decreeing as crimes moral principles upheld by the church, for example, refusing to officiate at a homosexual marriage and having anti-abortion convictions will be labeled as crimes. Christian bakeries will not only be, you know, prosecuted for refusing to provide wedding cakes, for same-sex marriages, they will be arrested for hate speech and bigotry, in many cases, will end up in prison. Also at this stage, governments will begin to consider tax exemptions 
which have long been allotted to churches to be a crime against the common people and therefore must be discontinued. That is already being addressed in our nation. Finally, the fifth stage is outright unmasked persecution in the form of public humiliation, fines, and imprisonments. Y'all having a good day already? Mm -hmm. Governments in this stage will do away with Christmas and Easter and other Christian observances. You do know that's being discussed. And ultimately close down all churches except for any who agree to be controlled by the ungodly government of the state or nation. State churches run by the state, preaching what the state says. Now, given the explanation that I've given you, it's not difficult to see where we are. Stage four. Now, I'm quoting the Lord. Stage four. Moving into stage five. Let me give you some real examples of what have happened in addition to the nurse being fired for wearing a cross. An electrician was fired just for being a believer. Not for witnessing on the job, but just because of his faith. He lived the life of Christ in front of them, and they didn't want anything to do with that. So they fired him. All these are true stories. A pastor was arrested for holding an outdoor service for the homeless at Christmas time because he had more than 10 people. A woman street evangelist was attacked and stabbed for sharing the gospel with the homeless in London. And for more than 30 years, she had preached the gospel to the homeless. Four street evangelists in the UK repeatedly harassed and mistreated, were mistreated by the police. Parents accused now of bullying their second grade child because they objected to classroom teachings about transgenderism. That was in California. They believed that the child had a right to choose, the state did, has a right to choose whether they're a boy or a girl. A medical doctor was arrested for providing emergency life-saving treatment for aborted babies born alive. And was fined thousands of dollars. And if he refused, he would lose his license and he would go to jail. He didn't stop. Professor James Casbin, a psychotherapist, was accused and censored for politically incorrect research on transgenderism's psychological effect on children and young adults. He just presented a paper to the university, and he was fired. Reverend Bernard Randall, chaplain at Trent College in England, fired for a sermon he gave at the school on identity politics. After his firing, this is what Reverend Randall said. And he was fired 15 minutes after he gave the message. My story sends a message to other Christians that you are not free to talk about your faith. It seems it is no longer enough to just tolerate LGBT ideology. You must accept it without question, and no debate is allowed without serious consequences. Someone else will decide what is and what isn't acceptable, and suddenly you can become an outcast possibly for the rest of your life. Need I say more? Number three, 
Number three. So in light of what is happening, how do we prepare for the days in front of us? Persecution, church, can only be persecution if what is coming at you is because of your faith and love for the Lord Jesus Christ. Not because you've been corrected on an issue. Most of us know very little about persecution. And we throw that word around as if it's just, they wouldn't let me sit in the seat. They wouldn't let me park my car. They wouldn't let me do this or they wouldn't let me do that. I'm being persecuted. No, no. The Word of God does not leave us without instruction. There are many scriptures that deal with persecution. Look at 2 Timothy 3.12. Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Now, I want you to see something here. Persecution is really a badge of honor. It means your life is making a difference in somebody else's life. They can't handle the heat. Paul said, those who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. There's no exemption from some measure of persecution coming your way, if it hadn't already. Perhaps from unsaved family, or from people you work with, or whomever. Somebody in the church, somebody. Persecution comes your way. Because you can only be persecuted as a Christian if they're persecuting you because of your godly walk with Jesus Christ. Not because you're being judgmental and attacking and, you know, coming against everybody and acting like you're somebody and you, I know it all. How many of you know what I'm talking about? I want you to notice what he said in this verse. He said, all who desire, say with me, desire. Desire, desire to live godly. Sometimes we think that persecution only comes to the giants of the faith or to preachers, or to evangelists, or to those in ministry who are doing great things for the kingdom. But the scripture says, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. If that's your desire, do you know how many of us just live our lives without ever even thinking about what you're doing? Is your desire for somebody to see Jesus? Are you living a life so that you want somebody to know him because they know you? Yes. We've talked about it a lot. I talk about it to you a lot. That when they meet you, they want what you have. I'm not talking about your money or your houses or your cars. I'm talking about the way you are obviously a conqueror yes. in the middle of whatever's going on. The way you live, the way you overcome Do you have that desire? I want somebody, whomever I meet, whomever I come to, I have a desire for somebody to know I belong to Jesus, and I have a desire that the way I live, somebody will find Jesus, because if not, they'll burn in hell. Yes. And I care about them, because Jesus cares about them. He died for us. Yes. And he says... Anyone who just desires to live a godly life, you're going to be persecuted. You don't have to be the most mature disciple in the room to be persecuted. You just have to desire to live a godly life. Paul says, get ready to be persecuted. The reality today is that Bible-believing, Bible-obeying disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ are the primary targets of persecution through any of the ways that I've already mentioned, through any of those five ways. And we shouldn't be surprised. 
because you live in the Bible Belt, though the belt has certainly been loose in the last recent years, <laughs> God has graciously given us this bubble. Amen. Praise His holy name. Amen. So we may not see this as clearly as how it's happening in other areas. You know, uh, other people talk to me who live in different parts of the nation, and things are awful in parts of the United States of America. We are not united. Amen. Amen. It is terrible, and coming to the forefront is an attack against Christians. Some of you may have heard what I happened to Mike Lindell, the my pillow fellow. All of his assets, personal and business, all bank accounts were totally shut down. This just happened in the last day or two. And for two reasons. One was his political stand, but one not being talked about as much is his Christian stand. That's right. Right. We better wake up. We better wake up. The Lord said he was going to take care of him. Praise the name of the Lord. And the Lord God is going to be glorified. Hallelujah. So, again, what does Jesus say about all of this? Let's look at Matthew 5 again with the new living. God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses you when people mock you and persecute you and lie about you and say all sorts of evil things about you because you are my followers. <laughs> Be happy about it. Be very glad. For a great reward awaits you in heaven. And remember, the ancient prophets were persecuted in the same way. Wow. Wow. Mm. I don't know. I don't know where Jesus calls, you know, persecution of blessings, but he points it out to us why he does it. Let me give you five reasons. One, persecution connects you to the cloud of witnesses. The saints of Hebrew 11, Hebrews 11, provide us of, of examples of immovable faith and uncompromising commitment. They let us know that persecution is not a unique blessing just for us. Thousands in the body of Christ over the centuries have been persecuted and brought great glory to the Lord through it, as well as bringing many souls into the kingdom because of what they went through. Let's look at Hebrews 11 for just one second here. We act like we know everything, and you find out you don't really know anything. We really don't. We start out, we're, we're mentioning that faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It's the evidence of things we cannot see. And then it begins to name people. By faith, Abel brought a more acceptable offering to God than Cain. By faith, Enoch was taken up to heaven without dying. He disappeared because God took him. That's what's going to happen to us. Hallelujah. And then verse 6, it's impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. Yes. It was by faith that Noah built a large boat to save his family and he obeyed God. He did what God asked him to. Faith Abraham obeyed when God called him to leave his home, didn't even know where he was going. Walk out the front door and wasn't even told to go to the left, not to the right. He just went. That's an amazing man. He went without knowing where he's going. It was by faith that even Sarah was able to have a child, though she was barren and was too old. 
She believed that God would keep his promise. That's what you and I need. That jumped off the page. She simply believed God would keep his promise. Amen. Well, I don't know how to hold up. Believe God doesn't lie. Amen. Find it in the book and believe God will do what he said. Yes. I mean, a whole nation was born out of her believing. And Abraham's, of course, Abraham was confidently looking forward to a city. He just believed he just didn't get caught up in things. And they believed that God would do what God said he would do. They just believed it. It was by faith that Abraham, verse 17, offered Isaac as a sacrifice when God was testing him. Abraham, who had received God's promises, was ready to sacrifice his only son, Isaac, even though God had told him, Isaac is the son through whom your descendants will be counted. Abraham reasoned. I like that because I reasoned a lot of things. Abraham reasoned that if Isaac died, God was able to bring him back to life again. That's... Wow. He, in other words, he thought about it. He thought about what God had said to him. And then he recognized in his heart who God really was. Amen. I don't know how all this is going to happen. None of this doesn't make any sense to me. But I do know this. God gave me his word. So if he has to just bring him back to life, he'll do it. Because some kind of way, Amen. there's a nation coming out of me. Amen. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. By faith, Isaac promised blessings, Jacob, Joseph, Moses. Moses, when he grew up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. And, I mean, it's just amazing. Moses left the land of Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He commanded the people of Israel to keep the Passover, sprinkle blood on the doorpost so that the angel of death would not kill their firstborn. You know, I, I just love to see how God does things, you know? You would think God would say something like, I'm building a hedge around Goshen, you know, and the death angel cannot come in here. But that's not what he said. He said, if he comes in here, if you've got blood on your doorpost, he won't touch you. But he did not say he won't come by your house to check it. Wow. That's a wow. Mm. And then he went on and, you know, talks about what happened about Jericho. And, and he goes talking about Rahab. And he talks about Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah and David and Samuel. All these wonderful people, you know. All that God had promised them, they shut the mouths of lions, quenched the flames of fire, escaped death by the edge of the sword. But others, he says, were tortured, refusing to turn from God in order to be set free. They placed their hope in a better life after the resurrection. Some was jeered at. Their backs were cut open with whips. Others were chained in prisons. Some died by stoning. Some were slawed, sawed in half. And others were killed with the sword. Some went about wearing skins of sheep and goats, destitute and oppressed and mistreated. They were too good for this world. The world was not worthy of them. Is what the, it's where the 2022 message. And he says... Desire to be like those. That they would say the world was not even worthy of them. Wow. Wow. Mm. Number two, persecution deepens your connection to Jesus. Insults, mocking of any kind of persecution because of your love for Jesus. It's an opportunity for you to go deep with the Lord. He knows what it's like to be hated and mocked. You know what it's like to be put to death in the midst of suffering? He's going to be the one that's comforting you. Number three, persecution increase your spiritual strength. Paul was incredibly familiar with persecution. He was chased out of cities, thrown into jail, threatened with death. 
What was his response? We rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, he says. He was stoned, you know, five times. He was beaten with whips. 39 lashes. Three times beaten with rods. Three times shipwrecked. Once spent a whole night and a whole day on the sea. Paul. You see, church, persecution is like a refining fire. It clarifies your priorities and does away with your distractions. It will determine what you're willing to die for. And the fact is that until you know what you're willing to die for, you really don't know what you're living for. It will determine what you're willing to die for. And the fact is that until you know what you're willing to die for, you don't really know what you're living for. Persecution number four brings blessings. You know, the devil would like for you not to hear the preparation that God's preparing us for. So don't, if you feel yourself about to kill over or something, jerk yourself up. Persecution brings blessings. Jesus promised that all who experience persecution here on earth, you're going to have blessings in heaven. And I want to remind you that in the midst of pain and trial on the earth, persecution reminds us that this is not our final destination. We don't belong here. When we were born again, we lost citizenship on the earth, and we gained citizenship. We don't belong here. We don't belong here. Number five. Persecution causes the church to grow. In his letter from prison to the church of Philippi, you mark that one down. Persecution will cause the church to grow. Amen. Philippians 1.12 Now I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. Persecution makes the church grow. So what was supposed to crush it, increased it. So let me give you a nugget. Joy is the thermostat in the Christian life. Persecution is the thermometer. Is your thermostat set to joy? If so, your temperature will be just fine in the face of persecution. Did you get it? Joy is the thermostat in the Christian life. Persecution is a thermometer. A, storm, a thermostat sets the temperature in a room a thermometer tells you what the temperature really is. Look what James said. James 1. Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. But when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete. You won't need anything. Now, all these promises assume that you and I are diligent in prayer and doing what the Lord said to do in the 2022 message, which was to so live in the Word that you think it, breathe it, digest it, walk in it so powerfully that you may be likened to those of whom it was said the world was not worthy. Of them. What should be your attitude toward the persecutors? Romans 4, 12, 14. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. One of the most powerful demonstrations of this principle in Acts 7 was Stephen. The martyrdom of Stephen. He was a man described as full of faith and full of the Holy Spirit. He was one of the very first deacons in the newly 
born church, and he became the first martyr. She was being stoned. Remember, it was Saul, Saul of Tarsus, the radical persecutor of the early church, was watching. And as Stephen drew his very last breath, my friend, bruised, battered, and bleeding, he said, Lord, please don't hold this to their account. Saul was sitting there. He didn't curse the, th the stone throwers. There doesn't seem to be any evidence that he even tried to preach to them. That's interesting because a lot of times we start trying to preach and make people feel guilty in a time like that, and guilt doesn't usually bring somebody to a genuine walk with God. I'll assure you one thing, those who participated in his murder never forgot it. Could it be that the power of forgiveness is what changed Saul of Tarsus into Paul? Harboring anger, hatred, bitterness, or desire for revenge toward our enemies hurts our own souls far more than it hurts them. It will kill the person who's holding it. And it doesn't even touch the one that you think you're doing it toward. Jesus said, I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Let's, as we close, let's be real honest. Loving your enemies <laughs> doesn't come naturally. Amen. And praying for those who are beating up on you is not my very favorite thing to do. You'd rather knock them into another land, at least I had. Amen. Don't you suppose that Jesus faced every temptation? The Bible says he did. Every point, just like us. And he doesn't ask us to do something. We, we cannot face something he did not face. That's right. He handled it. Loving our enemies is not an emotional issue. It's a Jesus issue. Yes. Aren't you glad he loved you? Yes. When you were his enemy? Yes. Oh, I've never been an enemy of Jesus. Oh, yes, you were. When you didn't know him. You and I, before we were born again, we were enemies of the cross. And enemies of Jesus. See, loving our enemies is not a humanitarian issue. It's a spiritual issue. First Timothy 2, 4 says that God desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Loving our enemies is a choice we make to desire and pray for the salvation of those who misuse or abuse us. It's a decision that we make. I'm going to pray for you. You don't have to tell them necessarily. Or you can based on if you're trying to be a goody two-shoes. But if you're saying and you think it might have a real impact, but if you're just saying, well, you can beat me up, but I'm praying for you, that don't cut it. You know, the Lord has called us to do. It's not an easy thing to do, but it's a godly thing to do, to pray for them. And it doesn't depend on how you feel. It depends on how obedient you choose to be before the Lord. I want to be obedient to the Lord. I know we're on the last road. I know heaven is in front of us. I know the time is short. I know that, whether you know that or not. But all of us here, you don't know you've got tomorrow. You don't even know you've got tonight. So everybody should know something that you're ready to meet the Lord. You know, you should know. We all should know. Church, we're twice-born people in a world of once-born people. I like that. Twice-born people in a world of once-born people. We're different. We're supposed to be different. And it's that difference that causes persecution. We do not let ourselves be overwhelmed with the cares of this world and the distractions of everyday life in these days. 
receive the strength. He promised you in the 2022 message. And let the Word of God keep you steady and free from worry or anxiety as you immerse yourself in His promises. What are some of His promises? I gave them to you. On page two, don't be anxious about what you will see and hear in this year as it begins. Things that are happening right now now it will begin with a bang he said for you who follow me for you who love me and abide my word protection as powerful as that which the children of Israel received in Egypt and in the desert has been decreed for you others may lack food he says but from the hand of your father I'm providing for you dangerous days he said but you're going to be protected, he said. Provision has already been decreed. So don't worry like the pagans do. I love it. Your heavenly Father has already stored what you like in closets and pantries in the heaven. And he'll give them to you. He will give them to you. But he says, in one day, I will suddenly move and the world will be shocked and bewildered. Literally, in one day. Just as, far as Esther was given wisdom in a very difficult and devastating situation, so you, my bride, you're going to be given abundance of wisdom and understanding in preparation for my return. Amen. 2022 will not be a happy year from the world's point of view. Things will not get better. They're going to get worse. This will be a holy year for those I love, though. It's going to be great. Exceptional blessings. Unique revelation in my word. Multiplied opportunities to stand strong with the Lord Jesus Christ. I will walk with you in the midst of the fiery plots of man and devil that they've planned against my church. He says, I'll walk with you. The government of this world have an agenda to do away with my church, but they have not counted on my sovereign power. Amen. Glory to God. The gates of hell shall not prevail against my chosen ones. And to all who receive it, I will impart my strength and my supernatural wisdom to make you bold as a lion and strategically skillful against the neighbor. I mean the enemy. Will you open your heart to me and receive what I want to impart to you? Prepare yourself for the fiery furnaces of this evil world. Even as I walk with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and you shall pass through whatever challenges you face without even the smell of smoke upon your garments. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. I invite you this day to choose faith, not fear. Do not be afraid. Do not fear. The Lord is saying it over and over again. Do not be afraid. Don't fear. Don't be afraid. Live in faith. I invite you this day to choose faith to make a hard and fast decision to be radical for me. Glory to God. Because he says, you are my priority. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. So I close with this. Revelation 22, 12. Behold, I'm coming quickly. And my reward is with me to render to every man according to what he has done. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I think they've got it from the New Living also. Yeah. Look, I'm coming soon. Bringing my reward with me to repay all people according to their deeds. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Oh, Pitiful clap, pitiful clap. 
That's the Lord's message. Not mine. Preparing for persecution. He's forewarning us and telling us to be at peace about the whole thing. He's going to take care of us. Hallelujah. Now, let me say this before we go. Church, I know that this is not the kind of message that everybody wanted to hear, and I understand all of that. It's what the Lord gave, and it's what he said you're going to need to know. And, I, and I, again, I know that many do not want to hear it. I'm very much aware, whether you're watching online or whether you're here, I'm, I'm aware of that. I know that. But I must do what God's called me to do. And, uh, you know, we must grow up the church and teach them victory. We are victorious over whatever comes our way. And the Lord is making sure that we are. He doesn't want us to be shocked. He wants us to stand together. And I know that whatever comes, He will meet it with us, before us, be with us through it. And uh, put a smile on your face. Some of you look like you're at a death march. <laughs> Hallelujah. You should be very happy that God is preparing you and telling you. You see, if people don't believe we're in the end days, they won't teach this. They won't teach it. They won't teach it. But I can't wait to see what the Lord's going to give us. I do know this. He's going to take care of us. I do know that. Won't you stand? Maybe someone's here and you've not given your life completely to the Lord. It's time, I promise you that, to give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. He loves you. He cares about you. He knows you by name. He knows no way for you to walk except victoriously. Strange days are in front of us. But we can do this thing. We can do these things. Let me say this now. I'm going, I'm going to be very blunt. If I've heard the Lord, there are things that right here even in this month, that's going to shock us. This week, this week is an important week, meaning that things may come our way. Or we may see things in the nation that we may be shocked over. I could be wrong, and if I am, so what? I'm just wrong. But I, I, he said it was going to start with a bang. And to me, some bangs have already taken place. And uh, so, you know, there's just a lot of things happening. But it all is saying Jesus is coming for his bride. He's coming to take us home. And praise God, we are part of what he's called us to be. We don't want to miss anything that's going on. I mean, God's going to tell us and look after us. But if you're here and you've not given your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, you don't want to be walking around not knowing him. Churches can't save people. It's your walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. Anyone here? Anyone? Say, I don't know the Lord, but I want to, Pastor. I want to. Anyone? anyone and you will see that we will walk in authority like we have never walked in before you will see that the healing power of God the delivering power of God will be manifested in these days that are in front of us beyond anything you can possibly imagine we're walking in these days where hell's pressing but the God Almighty is winning remember the devil is defeated and we want to be a part, as you're watching, uh, Velda will be teaching on the 20, 27th, do a night of healing. You want to be a part of it. And uh, it's going to be a glorious night, so we all want to be a part of it. Amen. Priest.
You know, I've done more than 35 years of short, easy, encouraging, outstanding, yay messages. And uh, you should be prepared. You should be prepared. You should be prepared. All of them growing us up, getting us ready for the coming of the Lord. I don't know any group in the whole world I'd rather uh, walk into heaven with than this group right here. Let's go together. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. And Jesus is definitely coming. I don't know when, but I know it's going to be pretty soon. That much I do know. Remind you that, that uh, uh, the State of the Church Address, Part 1, Part 2, Brother Hagin's message, as well as uh, the study notes uh, of today. And again, the Lord said to put them around in your house. Put them around in the church. Uh, have them available for the tribulation. I go on and say everything he said. For the tribulation saints. Or those who are left behind. So they will know what has happened. All of these messages is what he's been saying to me for. So, anyway. Bill, do we come in close for us, please? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lord God. What a word. Amen. Amen. What a word. Thank you, Father. Father, we humbly bow before you this morning with hearts full of praise and thanksgiving. Father, we're reminded that you said that you would not leave us ignorant. But, Father, you have said that you would tell us and show us the things to come. Father, we thank you today that you are preparing us, Father God. You're not leaving us ignorant. We won't be caught off guard. And, Father, we will determine to keep our faith, our hope, our trust, and our confidence centered upon you, upon your goodness, your mercy, and your grace extended to your children, Lord. Father, we remind ourselves, you said, greater is he that lives in us and he that lives in the world. You said, Father God, victory is ours, for the battle belongs to the Lord, but the victory comes to us. Father, you said in your word, why are you downcast? I'm the lifter of your head. Father, we pray today that we will so press into you, just lean into you, trust and rely upon you, that, Father God, that you truly are the lifter of our heads, that our countenance, Lord God, will reflect your goodness, your mercy, and your grace. Father, as your word says, that others will be hungry and jealous for what we have. Father, as the world perhaps walks in persecution, they will look at us and once again say, what is so different about you? How do you have such peace? How do you have such calm? How do you have such provision? And Father God, it will be the open doors of opportunities for to us to be able to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. As Jesus himself said, the good news. So, Father, as we go from this place today, we do not go with a downcast countenance. We go with the joy of the Lord upon us. We go leaping and joicing and praising our God, our Lord, our Savior, our healer, and our deliverer. And may we be living testimonies in these coming days to the goodness of our God. We bless you, we praise you, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless y'all. Have a wonderful day.